Uh, as you saw on the wide shot, as we promised you off the top, author Stephen Gray uh, joining us in studio. Thanks so much for coming in, Stephen. We appreciate happy, it. Yeah, happy to uh, be here. The book, uh, Cannabis and Spirituality, an Explorer's Guide to an Ancient Plant Spirit Ally. Uh, before we get into it, cannabis and its relationship with spirituality, how did you find yourself even interested in this? Uh, well, I'm from that demographic that uh, has been called like the hippies or the countercultural you know, era, whatever, you know. Um, nobody ever called ourselves hippies back then. That was what the so-called straights called right. us in those days. Um, so cannabis kind of came on, you know, into the culture fairly quickly, and uh, I was interested in it. Um, I didn't really think of it as a spiritual medicine, particularly at the time. I just liked it for a while there, you know. Um, but it was part and parcel of a package of things that were happening at the same t at that time, which was a, a burst of interest in spirituality and Eastern or Asian spirituality in particular, and the psychedelics. So I got interested in all of that, including the spiritual side of it. Um, and then, I mean, I, I, it would take me w way too long for the purposes of our show here to s say what happened after that. But I, I left it for a while um, and got involved with Tibetan Buddhist practice for a number. of years. I was going to say, were you a spiritual person to begin yeah. with? Yeah. Well, there were, you know, there was an in, there was a, a huge interest in in among the countercultural people um, at that time in the psychedelics, and the psychedelics are kind of almost a priori spiritual substances. Although a lot of people didn't necessarily think of it that way, just as a lot of young people now probably just think of taking some psilocybin mushrooms as a kind of a thrill ride, right? It's still, that mentality still exists, and it did then, too. But then there was this whole spiritual side of it, and I was always interested in that. Right from the first I started to hear about it, I was reading you know, books on Hinduism and Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and that sort of thing. You know? And for me, the psychedelics and the, and the Buddhism sort of dovetailed, but the, the, the Buddhists themselves weren't using them. Right. <laughs> so I kind of left that all behind. And actually, for me, cannabis use as a spiritual substance came after my reintroduction or re-entry into using psychedelics spiritually, which didn't occur until the late 80s or so when I started to see that there was information around saying that people had been using these substances for thousands of years, not, not casually the way we have done in our culture for the most part, but in you know, ritual and shamanic healing. Ceremonies. And ceremony and stuff. You know, indigenous people in various parts of the planet had been using these. So I got reinterested in combining the spiritual understanding that I'd been gaining from working with Tibetan Buddhism with the potential for amplifying all that and channeling uh, a powerful energy with the psychedelics. And that eventually connected me to the idea that, well, wait a minute, cannabis is one of those. It's not always considered that way, but it has an ancient history of that kind of use and uh, it's not getting enough attention. So I was having a conversation with one of the people who came to our conference that I was organizing, Kathleen Harrison, who's a, a, a world-renowned, uh, in her world anyway, <laughs> um, ethnobotanist, and uh, a wonderful, wise person. And uh, I said, well, you know, I think this needs addressing, but I don't think I have a whole book in it myself. And she said, um, uh, if you put that book together, I'd contribute to it. And that, that got me going. That was five years ago, and it resulted in the book uh, with 18 contributors counting me. Yeah. Did you, and there's a, a look at for the folks that are watching at home, yeah. oh, did you, <laughs> did it matter as you did more research into yeah. it, regardless of the religion or mm -hmm. maybe the geographical place on the planet, yeah. that cannabis tended to leak into it in different places at different times, different backgrounds? It was wide ranging as opposed to it was just in one spot on the planet. Yeah, well, you know, I like to use the term the people's plant. One of the contributors to the book calls it the people's psychedelic um, because it's always belonged to the people. It's always been part of folk culture and community, you know, for medical use, for practical uses, for building materials, um, and for spiritual use. I mean, you couldn't help but discover that, you know, before we had safe ways. Right. <laughs> you, you had to know every single plant in your neighborhood, right? Right. And what it was for. And it, was, it would have been essentially impossible not to discover that if you smoked it, threw it on your fireplace, you know, even tossed the leaves on the fireplace or something and got some secondhand smoke, there was going to be a bit of an alteration of consciousness. So, And the, is that what they were... Is in, in spirituality, as was it the altering the consciousness, or was that just part of it? There's many different... Because I would think that would be part of it. 
Sorry, what exactly? Spi- like the altering the consciousness would be one of the ways it's used spiritually. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's many different uses, but I would think that yeah. would be one to kind of open one's I would say mind. that's the central yeah. understanding of using cannabis as a spiritual medicine. Right. I mean, the, 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 you know, I don't know how, how, how much rambling I can do in, in, in the time that we have Well, here. let's see. Um, okay, well, <laughs> stop me then sure. <laughs> when you're ready. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to just give like a su- super condensed... Um, little primer on the nature of spiritual awakening. This is kind of from a Buddhist perspective. Um, Pretty much everybody is walking around encased in what Buddhists would call ego, which is the way that we build our lives to survive based on a whole collection or or, kit bag of um, ideas that we've formed in our heads, concepts and beliefs, right, that we've taken on from the culture and we build up ourselves. Um, It's not real. It's just, the sto- it's, it's just a story. And that what Buddhists would say that's an illusion, that we've created this fictional character um, to protect ourselves, essentially. And that the spiritual path has to do with gradually releasing or letting go of, the, of, of, of all those kind of stories that create filters and protection, layers of protection, and relaxing into the present moment, that we can trust that, that there's an intelligence in that, that there's a potential to open our hearts and, and find a, a peace in the present moment. You know, A lot of people are talking about it. Um, uh, Camille and I were talking a, a few moments ago about Eckhart Tolle and how he right. talks a lot about nowness, right? Entering and trusting into that moment. And where cannabis then comes in, potentially, um, and I do think of it, as others do, as a, an advanced spiritual medicine, not something you're necessarily going to understand and be able to work with effectively right away. But it, you could think of it, and I think it's very useful to think of it as a non-specific amplifier, as other psychedelics also are. And in other words, you're temporarily given a gift of um, amplified psychic energy, mind-body energy, you might say. And then it, the, the key issue is what your intention is to with that? What do you do with that? It's like you're given this tool, you're given this energy. What do you do with it? Well, if your intention, either consciously or unconsciously, is to escape, she'll help you go that way too, because she's amplifying that. She can exaggerate any kind of experience, essentially, right? Um, If your intention is to wake up, to heal, to be present, the amplification effect can be channeled in that direction. And then it becomes a matter of, well, how do you actually do that? So... Terence McKenna, the great, uh, late great uh, psychedelic philosopher, had a sort of crude admonition, which was, sit down, shut up, and pay attention. You know, like just be there for it. Surrender to it. Open up to it. Don't fill your space with all kinds of distractions. You know, don't crack a beer necessarily, or grab a pizza, or turn on the TV. Sit and meditate with it. I think when you asked about the historical use, yeah. that's kind of what they did. They chanted, they did yoga, they sat in silent meditation. They allowed the plant to be there. And when you can do that, it potentially has this remarkable ability to uh, you know, amplify us deeply, more, more deeply into the present. When you talk about that it has been around so long and its yeah. roots go back, it seems that was there a, a point in time where regardless, it was only a, a minority that still followed suit with that? Because it, it mm. doesn't seem like it's used as much, maybe, or we're aware, I should probably say, yeah. that it's being used I mean, as much. And, and we currently. might see a turn now, yeah, yeah, in our day and age. Well, that's what the book's for, yeah. hoping there will be well, a turn. Okay, well, it um, could be the right time. I think one of the original subtitles I was toying with was, you know, the reclaiming and rehonoring of an ancient spiritual ally, right? Right. Um, uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's actually a complicated question and way more detailed than right. we could talk about. But um, there is an element of it as what you might call the left-hand path or the sort of the outsider path, right? That, um, uh, you know, the short version is that institutional religions and secular authorities tend to want to control people, right? Yes. So they don't actually want you to have your own spiritual experience. I mean, there's this whole really fascinating thing that happened uh, in the uh, early years of Christianity, which was essentially a battle between the Gnostics, who were the people who were more interested in actual direct experience, and the what they called the Orthodox, who were the people who were putting together the hierarchy of the church and who claimed that the only, the only way you could ever have a, a, a quote, re-spiritual experience was through the mediation of the priest and the hierarchy, right? right? They wanted control over our minds, you know, our cognitive liberty. 
So, um, so cannabis has been outlawed and vilified occasionally here and there for that reason, because you can't control people when people are having their own experiences. And that goes for all the other See, psychedelics the, the, as well. See, the campaign of misinformation. Absolutely. It, whether it was the church or whether it was the government, yeah. it seems that this plant, for some reason, and uh, I'll see if uh, Camille has any questions for us, but yeah. it just seems that this plant, for whatever reason, yeah. is the victim of misinformation at many different levels and from many different places. Yeah. Can you understand? Well, is, that, is that because it's all of the, about that. the free thinking, it's, it's free about will? The, it is. It's absolutely, you know, um, it's, it's an issue of cognitive liberty. You know, that my view and the view of many people is that it's nobody else's business what I do with my mind unless I'm harming other people. That's not anybody's business. No authority has the right to tell me what I can do with my mind, right? Um, but there, people have a lot to gain from controlling other people uh, and, um, and scaring them as well. Yeah, no, you know? fear always. Yeah. <laughs> so, that seems to be the biggest. That, that, fear yeah. always sells. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to have a couple of questions coming in. Thank you very much, Camille. Uh, oh, wait, Carmen, I'm sorry. I keep calling you. No, no, that's okay. Camille. I keep calling you Camille yeah. for, for no apparent reason. My apologies. Uh, okay, here, I got a question for sure. you from uh, our friends in Alberta. This is uh, Gene. Yeah. Uh, please define what a spiritual awakening is. Yeah, well, I think I already made an attempt yeah. at that. Um, that give it, me a call. That give there me a is such terms, thing as yeah. what you might call uh, yeah. unconditional reality or unconditioned reality that is not filtered through our beliefs and concepts. And as Buddhist teachings would say, that is our true nature and that's uh, accessible to every human being. It's not a theory. It's not a, you know, a set of dogmatic or fixed beliefs. It's who we really are. And what, what you know, 99.99% .99 of human beings are engaged in is an active process of resisting, protecting, denying, ignoring that, right? Um, and that's another reason why the authorities, it's complicated, but it's, you might call it projection. People who are afraid of life on some level, who are afraid of their own natural state, their own awakening, don't want anyone else to experience it because that's a threat. That person becomes a mirror to you. So that functions as well, right? Yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. So, so spiritual awakening, as I understand it, is a natural um, reality that's the reality. It has nothing to do with, you know, doesn't belong to any religion or point of view or anything. It's just who we are when all the other stuff falls away and what we have to do to get there, so to speak. Um, come back to ourselves, really. You know? yeah. one, one last question. This is from uh, Thunder Bay, and, and you might be able to answer this, you might not, just from your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, have you found any strain or specific dose uh, would you recommend, and I, I don't want to use the term recommend, maybe suggest, yeah, for right. someone who's looking it's to explore their spirituality, yeah. here, yes. who's looking to explore spirituality? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it's a big topic. I address uh, in one, I have four, four or five chapters in the book, and I have a section on dosage and on strains. They're okay. both important, especially dosage. Um, uh, here's the simple way of putting it. Uh, the op this is only one way to look at it, yeah. but the optimal dosage is the dosage uh, that you both want to and can handle. Um, this is a big, under, you know, the big topic to try to understand. When I say can handle, um, cannabis is actually a reality medicine. It's not a drug. Uh, you know, when you when you treat it reverently and respectfully as a spiritual medicine, it's not a drug. It's a reality medicine. It expands things, right? It, that amplification, amplification thing that I was right. talking about. Yeah. So. Um, it threatens the ego because the ego is, doesn't want anything to change, right? So um, uh, the stronger the dosage, the bigger the threat. Hence the potential for fear, paranoia, which comes up. Right. You know, paranoia is essentially just an elaborate construction of fear, and it's because your cocoon has been threatened. The cannabis ups the anti, ante and potentially threatens the status quo that way. So um, I, there's a key phrase that several of us use in the book, which is less is more. Start small, especially if you're not used to it. And when I say can handle, it's like, what is the dosage, maximum dosage at which you can stay present, where you can sit down and meditate and not be completely caught up in thought all the time, not uh, become dizzy or nauseous or scared or whatever. If you've experienced any of those symptoms, you're either, you've either overdosed or you haven't learned how to uh, channel the energy, yeah. right? So it's really important, and as a lot of people know now, 
well, first of all, the THC content in a lot of this stuff is extreme, you know. Right. And it becomes d potentially dangerous for people where even one toke, if you're a sensitive person, um, that's another issue, too, that we could talk about if there's time. I don't know what your time factor is, but, um, you know, the adolescent brain and young people. Oh, no, it's yes, an for important sure. Issue. Oh, no, it's, yeah. uh, I don't know. You've talked about it on yes, other shows? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, so inhalation, especially with these high THC medicines now, can be very, very powerful and cause people to freak out. My doctor hates cannabis, my family doctor, because the only way he ever encounters is, is that people come into his office having a panic attack, right? Right. That's overdosing. That's not knowing how to channel the energy. Well, right? as, uh, start small. Yeah, start, start small. Start small. It's the only, it, makes, it, it makes sense for Absolutely. no matter what it would be. That would, yeah. seems to be the best and advice. And I was going to say that even with, or especially with uh, orally ingested cannabis, because the ceiling is far higher, the duration is much greater. Uh, you, you're a journalist, or more or less, yes. you know who Maureen Dowd is? Yes. Op-ed uh, right. from the New York Times. She went to Colorado. She, she bought a cookie or something. Apparently they warned her not to eat the whole thing. She went back to her hotel room and ate the whole thing. And she said, I thought I had died and nobody was telling me. That's actually spiritual medicine. Like that's ego death. That's, that's what um, awakening is, is ego death in a sense. But if you, if you don't know how to approach that, that's why I call it an advanced, or we call it an advanced spiritual medicine. It's not something to trifle with in that way. It's too bad she didn't realize. Uh, <laughs> Stephen, thank you it so much for a good coming article. Exactly. <laughs> I, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, tremendous. Uh, Stephen Gray, uh, author of the book Cannabis and Spirituality, an Explorer's Guide to an Ancient Plant Spirit Ally. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for coming. Coming in.